Father, thank you for your love for us this morning. Thank you that your mercies are renewed each and every morning. Thank you, God, that we have the truth of your word to stand upon. And so here we are this morning, God, simply wanting to say Happy Father's Day to you, and not just to say it, but to live a life that reveals that it's coming from our heart. And so thank you, God, that there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And so we're so thankful for that grace that allows us to stand in your presence or sit in your presence or kneel in your presence or fall on our faces in your presence this morning and know that you see us as a precious child, all because of what Jesus did. So, Lord, be glorified in our midst this morning. That's what we're praying. If you wouldn't mind turning your Bibles this morning to Galatians chapter 2. We continue our study in the book that we've kind of subtitled God's Gospel of Grace. Everybody's heard of Billy Graham, yes? And Billy Graham is one of the people that really gets lifted up in our day and age. Well, Billy was human. Uh, Billy uh, did a lot of traveling, and one of the days that he was traveling, he was driving, and sure enough, uh, all of a sudden there was this lights twirling on behind him and this siren going off and sure enough a uh, police officer pulls Billy over and sure enough writes him a ticket and tells him well we are um, you're actually going to need to go to court and the good thing for you is that it's a good day and uh, we can get you into court in about 90 minutes so Billy goes to court Billy is in front of the judge and the judge asks him uh, sir the police officer says here that you're traveling 10 miles over the speed limit. And Billy said, I was, I'm guilty. And the judge says, well, sir, that'll be a dollar per every mile that you were going over. Uh, you can pay uh, the bailiff at the end and you can be on your way. And he looks down at the paper and he says, Mr. Graham, Mr. William Graham. And the judge looks closer and says, Dr. Graham? But Dr. Billy Graham, is that actually you, the preacher, <laughs> the evangelist? And Billy said, yes, sir, it is. I am. I'm sorry. He says, well, sir, um, you're guilty, um, but it would be my honor to pay your debt. And so the judge pulls out his wallet and takes a $10 bill out, pays it in front of everybody, and Billy's response is, that's how our Heavenly Father loves us. We're guilty but he's willing to pay it on our behalf. And this is why Paul is so upset with what's going on here. He's so upset that there's people coming in and saying that's not enough. To believe that God was willing to pay the debt is not enough. You've, you've got to become Jewish. You've got to obey all of the law. That's what's going on here in Galatia. And it is racking Paul's heart to believe not only that there's people that are doing this, but even more so, as we saw last week, what was Paul marveling over? That they had turned away so soon to something that was not another gospel, but that was the false gospel. And so that's where we pick up today's Galatians chapter 2, and if you wouldn't mind standing with me. Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. I think, I know we have them, but I think we're everybody okay. Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and also took Titus with me, and I went up by revelation, and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission for even an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. 
And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with them, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified." But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. And as we go through it, Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us into all truth. Bear fruit out of our lives from the seed of the gospel that we hear today. For the glory of the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So as we started last week, and we carry on this week, we're picking out that Paul is really coming to the defense of the gospel, but in order to come to the defense of the gospel, he's also having to come to the defense of himself as a minister of the gospel. He's carrying on with that right here in verse 1. We saw last week he talked about coming up to Jerusalem um, after three years of going off into the desert of Arabia before he saw anybody, and even when he went up, he only saw Peter, and he, he saw James, and he only saw him for a couple of days. He continues on here saying that then after 14 years, I don't know about you, but when you tell a story about kind of what's happened in your past, and if you're the person who's listening to somebody tell their story, they say then after 14 years, that's kind of like a big jump, right? Some of you haven't been alive 14 years yet, right? Yeah. Well, just as of April, it's been 14 years, right? But yeah, but somebody else right? That's a long time, but here's what he's trying to tell them, is that over the past 18 years, he's only had interaction with the leadership of the church in Jerusalem twice, and so you can't come at him and say that what you're doing is just spouting off what these guys have told you. He's making it very clear that God has been working through him for almost two decades now, and so what he's telling them is believable, We saw that last week. He says, and all of these things, I'm not lying. And what good would it be for him to lie? Because everybody knows that this is the guy who used to be persecuting the church. This was the absolute number one public enemy of the church of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, something happened. We heard that he got knocked off his horse and he's actually preaching the gospel now. This is crazy good news, but it's so possibly hard to believe that Others aren't actually believing it. So he says, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem. We went over this when we were looking at Acts 15, the verses one to four. This is that time that he's talking about. And he went with two people. He took Barnabas. You remember Barnabas, right? The son of encouragement. We hear that before for those of you who are Bible readers. Um, He's somebody who had a great testimony among the early church. But he also took with him on this trip that he's talking about a guy by the name of Titus. And Titus, who used to be a Gentile, used to be a a non-believing Gentile, has come to faith in Christ. And not only has he come to faith in Christ under the leadership and tutelship of Paul, he's grown to be a leader. And so this is who he took with them. 
and he's a leader in the church. And so these guys go up with him in verse two, what led Paul to go? He says, I went up by revelation. The guys in Jerusalem didn't call and say, hey, Paul, we want to have a meeting. Paul's saying, hey, the spirit of the Lord told me I needed to go. And so I went and I took these guys. And when I went, what did I do? I told them what my doctrine was. I communicated to them, it says here, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. He understood that the church leadership of the time was really centered out of Jerusalem, was really based in James and Peter, and that God had chosen him to be part of something that God was doing, but there was some slight confusion with what was really going on. And people were going like, well, can it be that the guy who used to be the biggest enemy of the church is actually preaching the true gospel? Or is this just another way for him to get more people to take and to persecute them? Because unlike today, when we think of church persecution in America, when we're talking about persecution back here, we're talking about ixne life. We're talking about beatings. We're talking about being killed, literally being martyred, being crucified like Christ. And so this was important stuff that they wanted to know, and it's understandable that we as human beings aren't necessarily always the quickest to believe everything which sometimes is actually good, right? It's a self-preservation mechanism. God's kind of designed it that way. And really scripture tells us to try the spirits, test the spirits, make sure that those who you're gonna put your faith, hope and trust in are worthy because they're leading you down the right path. So we get that. So Paul is dealing with all of these issues and he's telling them that when I went up, you know, I told them, but I didn't tell everybody. I was kind of, exercising some wisdom and discernment that I privately went to those that were of reputation. And we saw that before. He basically went to a couple of the church leaders and said, hey, I know that there's people questioning whether or not I'm really a messenger of the gospel or not, whether I really am acting as an apostle or not. Well, he told them because he wanted to make sure very clearly. And it says something here that maybe that's kind of a little awkward for you at the end of verse two. He says, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. We know from the rest of Paul's writings, he understood he wasn't running in vain by following after the true gospel and telling others. But he also understood this, that if you're going to do something that God is calling you to do, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be opposition. The enemy will always come against that which the Lord is trying to do. That's why he's the enemy. And that is what drives him for all eternity until the day that judgment comes for him. He is constantly trying to thwart the plans of God. And Paul's not naive enough to not understand that if he's been called by God, then guess what? The enemy's going to be coming against him. Um, Paul understands something about the enemy. Don't you think? When he comes to Christ and all of a sudden is walking with Jesus, he realizes that, hey, I may have been the most sincere persecutor of the church there ever was, but as a persecutor of the church, who is he following orders from? The enemy himself. He thought he was serving God and he had been duped. So it'd be easier for him to write write later in life that the enemy himself can disguise himself as an angel of light. He understands that. And so he's very, very adamant and because he, he's very, very skilled and he's had great uh, experience in this realm. So he wants to make sure that people understand the truth of the gospel. The problem is that there's guys that had snuck in already and they were already perverting the gospel, guys that he had warned them about. He had told them this was going to happen. And their perversion was that, hey, you cannot be a Gentile Christian and just be a Gentile Christian. You actually have to become Jewish. You have to follow the laws of Judaism in order to be a follower of Christ, which Paul understood very clearly (laughs) because why? He was Jewish and he had strictly followed everything according to what he understood the law to be. And where did that lead him? to persecuting the only one that could save him. The fulfillment of the law of the Jews. The king of the Jews was killed because of Judaism. He understood this better than anybody. And so now he is more than willing and more than able 
to stand up and say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. But he's got to make a case. He knows how people think. And the case he's making involves other people. Verse three says, not even Titus was compelled to be circumcised. So a new leader in the church who had basically been trained in the scriptures through Paul and possibly through others. But this guy, Paul is vouching for, hey, he's a Gentile leader. He's not compelled to get circumcised. Now, this is interesting, though, because who else was he saying was traveling with them? Timothy. What do we know happened with Timothy? Scripture tells us that Paul actually circumcised Timothy so that what? The gospel wouldn't be hindered. And Timothy was fine with it. But in this case, for Titus, Titus was going, well, that may have been good for Timothy, but for me, I don't have to be circumcised. We have to remember, too, that Timothy was half and half as far as his lineage, half Gentile, half Jewish. Titus is full Gentile. He sees scripture, he sees faith in Christ. And was there anything ever in any of the gospels that we've read that ever gave the hint that Jesus expected people to be circumcised in the skin? If anything, no, he called people out because it was to be circumcised in the heart is what he was looking for. Right? And so this we have now. Paul here just going very clearly, hey, Titus, he didn't want to be, he didn't see it clearly. Scripturally, he didn't need to be circumcised, but because false brethren secretly brought in. And this, beloved, is the reality of the church that we always have to be aware of. So sometimes people come in not for the goal of being edified or to be part of the process and how we all get built up together, but they're coming in to see who they can pluck off and pull away. And it doesn't mean necessarily that they come on Sunday mornings, but they do. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not coming on the outside, at your grocery store, in your neighborhood gatherings. We need to understand that there are those who are seeking to draw away others from the truth, and it's been going on from the very beginning because they come in by stealth, to spy out the liberty which we have in Christ Jesus. Everybody say liberty. Liberty. How many of us like freedom? How many of us like liberty? And this is where, once again, as a pastor, as a preacher, as a teacher of God's word, that we always get a little concerned because we as human beings have the ability to take what God's beautiful design is for something and mess it up horribly. Because... We love our liberty so much that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that liberty isn't liberty to do whatever it is that we want. Liberty is actually the ability to do whatever God wants us to do. Because before we came into a right relationship with God through Christ, that was impossible. Right? Because who was on the throne of our lives at that time? Who was God? We were. But now that God is God, we have the ability to yield. But here's what Paul's making very clear in all of this, and he's going to get down to this at the end, is that if it's not based in Jesus and Jesus alone, if our faith is not based in Jesus and Jesus alone, we have a false faith. Works, and at this time, uh, it was going back to a Jewish background, but when you read Guys, like I mentioned last week with Martin Luther, he was dealing with the Roman Catholic Church at this time. And that works and things that you could actually quote unquote buy to get your salvation was happening. No, that, that isn't it. That's not what Jesus came. That wasn't the message of the true gospel. But we must understand that there are those who want to bring us into bondage. But Paul said very clearly in verse three, we did not yield submission even for an hour. What's he telling them? They tried, but when it was us in the ring, you know, this was a battle. I don't know if you, any of you are boxing fans. I'm not the biggest boxing fan, but I do uh, appreciate the world of sport because of the stories of the people. And so there's a guy last night, he's got a, like an English or Irish accent. Are there any boxers fans in here? There's a giant guy, he's a heavyweight guy. He's like six, nine and a half. He's a giant of a man, but just happened to see the highlights after the thing. Immediately, you know, he just won. He knocked some other guy out uh, who was supposedly another heavyweight that was, I mean, 
looked like my size. The other guy looked like a Goliath type guy. But Goliath basically gets on the thing. First and foremost, I want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for saving my soul. And thank you for helping me with knock that guy out. You know? <laughs> and I know well, for a lot of people, it's like, well, hey, gosh, the guy's got a public forum of gazillions. And he is a, obviously a macho man. He's a professional fighter. And he gets up there, and the very first thing he wants to do is thank Jesus for saving his soul. Wow, loved it. See, Paul understood that there were going to be some that would encourage people to freedom to say, yes, do that. And there's others going to be that come along and say, dude, you shouldn't be saying that. You know, you're, you're, you're getting paid to hurt people, right? And, you know, it's one of those things to where, where is our freedom actually at in Christ? Well, I tell you what. If you're going to read uh, the works of Luther, if you're going to read the works of Paul and see what he's saying, they understood that our freedom is there to be who God made us to be, and we answer to only God. But we do have the scriptures to help all of us to encourage one another whether we're on the right track or not. Either here, the, cure, the, 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 the key word in all of that, though, is encourage. Remember the word that we went over before? We talked about this. What was the word? Anybody remember that? That gentle helping one another to know? Anybody remember that? Because I lost it right now too. It wasn't in my notes. It was just coming. Admonish. Woo. Thank you, Floyd. You know, Floyd's the little guy that works in your memory banks back there to pull stuff up. The biblical term is to admonish one another, Scripture says. And it basically means that as brothers and sisters, we come along, put our arm around each other and say, hey, I'm not sure if you realize this, but I'm not sure if what you're doing or saying is necessarily the best way to do that that brings glory to God. And it's gentle. It's not the kind that gets in somebody's face and yells at them, because I don't know about you, but somebody gets in my face and starts yelling right away, what do I do? Closed for business, closed. Well, because you obviously don't love me because you're not approaching me in that, in this way. Paul wants us to understand that, hey, there are things worth fighting for. And when we see in the life of Jesus, he's super gentle to everybody he ever deals with except who? Religious leaders who misrepresent God the Father. I think biblically, when somebody's misrepresenting God, we have the ability, but we need to remember what Scripture says, as though somebody is like an elder within the body or something, you need to approach them in love. But the fact of the matter is, they're really the only people that we see in Scripture that God says, these are the people that you kind of need to be super, super ultra firm. And it may even appear that you're a little miffed or peeved with them. And that's what Paul's doing here. Not even for an hour did we listen to these guys who were trying to do this. Why? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Because the message of the gospel is so important that sometimes we have to get into discussions that may seem like arguments that may hurt people's feelings. Because it's eternity that's at stake here, beloved. Because it's eternal. So the admonition from Scripture is to, if at all possible, live at peace with those among you. Yes, but at the same time, too, we understand that there are times when the truth is not necessarily what our friends and family want to hear, but they need to hear it. Because if they don't hear it from us, who are they going to hear it from? So Paul continues on about this time that he went back and the things that were happening between him and the leadership there in verse 6 says, those who seem to be something, whatever there were, it makes no difference to me. Apparently, there were some Christians within the community there that weren't necessarily the apostles, but some people had some reputation. You kind of know that now, that people oftentimes are given status within the body of Christ for things that aren't necessarily things that God has given them status for. Sometimes people have reputations that they're knowledgeable of Scripture when they're not or that they're people who are actually, you know, filled with the Spirit when not necessarily they are. Paul's basically saying here, there were some people there that were the supposed stars of the local body. 
Um, but I want to make it very clear to you what Paul says here. He's says, saying, I want to make it very clear to you what God says. God shows personal favoritism to no man. We can come up with reasons why we should admire somebody. Paul's saying that, you know what? What really matters to God is what is in the heart of the man. We know that from Scripture, right? We as human beings tend to look on what? The outside. That all went down when Saul became king. You know, he, he was a shoulder height above everybody else, and he had long flowing hair. He was like, you know, the original Fabio or something. And that when every year when he'd cut his hair once a year, it weighed so much because he had so much hair. Right. I know. There was a bald guy in the back laughing at that right now. So this, this concept of personal favoritism, hey, no, God's looking at the heart. And this is one of the things I think that's probably one of the neatest aspects as a follower of Jesus to understand is that God doesn't look at me like anybody else in the world does. He sees through all of this and sees who I really am. And there are times because of whatever it is that we do in life that sometimes we have to put on the facade. Sometimes we have to put on the happy face. Anybody who has a job knows that you cannot be totally 100% honest and truthful all the time when you go into work. Because if you are, you'll probably lose your job when you're having a bad day, right? Because if you answered everybody how you were really feeling at the time, guess what? Other people are not going to be happy. God sees through all of that, beloved. And here's the amazing thing, is that he sees through all of that and all the junk, and he loves us. Yeah, shake that head, J.D., I get it. It's the thing that amazes me most about God is that I cannot find anywhere in Scripture that he's looking at me ever and going, Chaz, you idiot. Chaz does that. The devil does that. God never does that. Because he sees us through the glasses of Jesus, the grace of God is so stinking amazing, it should make us all just go, wow. Wow. Several times a day, every day of the month, you know, as the Beatles would say, eight days a week, we should be amazed at his love. But understand this, he doesn't show a personal favoritism. Uh, this is a direct rever- uh, reference, I believe, to what's stated in Leviticus 19, but more importantly, Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 44. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Anybody remember that one lately? That's one of those verses that we don't necessarily have on a memory card, or is it necessarily anybody's favorite verse? Because this is not natural. This is the supernatural. Because naturally, we want to hate our enemies. We want to curse those that curse us. We want to do bad to those who hate us. And we don't want to pray for, well, we don't want to pray in the way that I think God's saying here to pray for them. God wants us to pray that those people, we'd actually have a heart that God would bless them. Ooh, right? But that's the reality of it. And then Jesus says in verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. No personal favoritism. Because each and every one of us were made in his image. Paul understands something very clearly here that sometimes is the reality. He says that none of those that seem to be of importance there. He said none of them added anything to him. Yeah, ouch. (laughs) There was nothing that he had experienced in his past, you know, 18 years of walking with the Lord that any of these men that were being elevated by people, none of them added anything to him. None of them bolstered him. None of them edified him. None of them did anything that encouraged or strengthened him. And beloved, that's an indictment 
that sometimes we in the church can lose sight of our ability to either uplift one another or we can put and pull each other down. See, it's important for us to understand that the body of Christ is a body with Christ at the head. And if this body does not get along, what's it look like? Now, I'm Samoan, so you might have just thought I was doing the Samoan slap dance thing. No. But if I really went at it like I wanted to right there, I would be in super pain right now because that's what it looks like when the body doesn't edify one another. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. And as we do that, guess what? We add to one another. And I want to encourage you, and this will always sound strange because it's coming from a pastor. Don't always look at going to church on Sunday mornings as something that you're only doing for you. You have no idea how it encourages your roommates <laughs> when you're there and how your roommates wonder and are concerned when you're not there. You know, roommates, what I'm saying is that we tend to sit all in the same place all the same time, you know, every time. But the fact of the matter is that when we come together to corporately worship, guess what? It encourages everyone, not just you. And I think this is one of the things in Scripture that we kind of miss out on, especially in 21st century church, is that it's so I-oriented, me-oriented, that we lose sight of the fact that we're a body. It's a we. You know, the selfie, right, is the modern-day example of what it's all about. Picture of me here, picture of me here. I love it when I pull out and say, hey, come on, let's take a picture together. And they say, oh, we're gonna take a selfie? I said, you can't take a selfie with more than one person. It's a wheezy. <laughs> it's about us. It's not just about me, it's about us. I want pictures because every time you lose somebody, you realize you didn't take enough pictures. Every time somebody you love is gone and you go to look for the pictures and you realize, I know we went on this trip together, where are the pictures? And we live in a day and age where you can take three gazillion pictures of every event. Many of us do that and then post them all for every, the world to see, I get that. But the fact of the matter is that there were days when we were younger, right, Jim, there was this stuff called film. You might have to explain that to the girls later. That you actually had to be like particular about the pictures you took because you only had 24 or at the most 36. And if you didn't have a spare thing of film, it's like, oh my gosh, right? And then sometimes you overexposed the film. You know, you opened up the back and all of a sudden it wasn't done and you just lost all the pictures, right? Beloved, we add to one another. And so don't you ever forget it. You're important to everybody else. So Paul saw that these guys didn't add anything to him, and he says, verse 7, on the contrary. But they saw the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to him. They saw, they witnessed with their own very eyes the reality and the truth that, hey, God's doing something through Paul to the Gentiles. And this is one of the things that Judaism has always kind of lost out on the fact that when they were chosen by God as the least of the peoples on planet Earth, they were the apple of his eye, but that wasn't just the only reason that they were chosen. They were also chosen to be the example that if God would choose you guys, you can tell everybody else that, hey, if he would choose us, I think he would take you as well. That they were meant to be the example that God so loved the world. And that was even before the advent of Christ walking planet Earth, that God so loved the world. See, these guys now were seeing that, hey, that, wow, and there's so many passages in Scripture that actually talk about God reaching out to the Gentiles. But they're seeing it now with their own eyes that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to Paul as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. Now, when we read through uh, the book of Acts, we've seen it already. It wasn't like Paul only could talk to Gentiles and Peter could only talk to Jews, correct? As a matter of fact, probably one of the most amazing things that happened was when Peter has his vision 
about rising and killed, eat not so, Lord. Nothing unclean has ever touched these lips, except the words that have come out of my heart, right? But he gets it. God uses Peter and uses him mightily to bring the gospel initially to the Gentiles. Because at that time, Saul was still Saul. And so it's not like it's a division. But they did see at this stage, guess what? The majority of Paul's ministry was to Gentiles. The majority of Peter's ministry was to the Jews. Okay, they saw that. They realized God was doing something like that. And not only did they realize it, the three pillars, James, Cephas, and John, hey, they perceived that the grace that had been given to him. Paul understood. We talk about this. He understood the grace that had been given to him. Did everybody else? See, this is the problem that we have within our religiosity. Religiosity often removes grace. But without grace, the gospel isn't the truth. It's not because we were good that God saved us, beloved. Au contraire, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And they perceive that, hey, this guy got grace. Because if anybody was going to get lightning bolts and lightning bolts and lightning bolts, it should have been this guy. But he didn't. He got grace. And because God's obviously doing something and chose somebody for our team that we wouldn't necessarily have chosen, right hand of fellowship. Keep going, bro. Keep going. We may not understand it all, but we know this. God's graced you, and you're bringing the grace to people, and people are hearing They're following Jesus now. So they go. They go to the Gentiles. And they went to the circumcised. And the only thing that they desired in verse 10 that was important to them was to remember the poor, which Paul said we were eager to do. And we're not talking about poor in spirit here. We're actually talking about the actual socioeconomic class of the poor. And it's something that has always been important. Uh, we have an opportunity as a church. We'll, we took an opportunity uh, this week as a church. Uh, Crazy Faith Ministries, remember them? We did the outreach with them. Um, their vehicles got ransacked this past week. Uh, stuff was stolen. And the thing that they were most concerned about, which I love about them, was their sound system. Because the main reason why they do what they do is so that people can hear the gospel. And they had no idea what they were going to do concerning that sound system. So Freedom Calvary is buying them a new sound system tomorrow so that they can preach the gospel. And and, And we do this not to, I say this not to puff anybody up, but it's the reality of that nobody else had stepped up yet that had heard the news. And some people are going to try to figure out how, you know, to get people together and Maybe we can do a fundraiser for it. And I saw the amount of money and I said, that's, we can do that. We'll do that. Just, just these people love the lost. They love the poor and they want to bring the gospel to them and we'll, we'll, we'll come alongside and help them. This, hopefully, we always remain eager to do as well. So now in verse 11, it changes. When Peter had come to Antioch, <laughs> ding, round one, I withstood him face to face. You remember Antioch in Acts chapter 11? This is a place of great importance to the early church. This is where followers of Jesus were first called Christians. Remember, it was not a term of respect or honor. It was extremely derogatory. Uh, These little Christs basically was what the word was meaning, but it's who we are. We desire to be little Christ as we follow him, that we, people would see us and would see him. But there's something going on here that Peter was having, making a big mistake with. Paul says he withstood him to his face because Peter was to be blamed because before Peter was fellowshipping with the new converts who happened to be Gentiles, he was eating among them. He was uh, basically dwelling, living among them like, hey, we're just one happy family. But then some of the leadership from Jerusalem came, and when they came, Peter all of a sudden wouldn't eat with the Gentile converts. He would not have meals of fellowship with them. And in essence, he was going back to Old Testament Jewish 
laws and following those. Interesting, huh? That somebody in leadership can actually make mistakes. We're human. We can. And for some reason, God allowed this to happen. And Paul knew that it wasn't going to be a comfortable situation, but Paul had to do what Paul did. He confronts him. It's funny because the picture in my mind that I get this whenever I read this is that before the guys from James come, you know, you know, we are families playing in the background. People are coming together for the love feast because they used to do it primarily where they'd have communion to where it wouldn't be like at the synagogue. It would actually be at somebody's house or they'd have a gathering or they'd have a meal, be like a bring and bless. And then they would do communion. So in my mind, this is a beautiful picture and the we are family is playing the background. It's all good. But then when those... <laughs> When James showed up, all of a sudden there's this division and there's the, you know, Pink Floyd's wall gets built. And all of a sudden, hey, those guys are here, so I'm just going to hang out with the Jewish guys. Peter feared, Scripture says, those of the circumcision. He was concerned more with how he was being thought of by man than by the God that saved him. Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with them. And this is where leadership has to realize why it's so important and why Paul was very clear in writing to both Titus and Timothy and why we just seem to understand it, that why it's important for anybody who's going to stand before you as a minister, how we live is important. Because if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, we saw your pastor at the bar the other night. The bar. What was he doing at the bar? I don't know, but he was there. Well, the bar. I'm a pool player, billiards. So if you ever hear that, I've never done it in Pueblo because I'm afraid in the sense of if somebody were to see me and say, hey, we saw your bar. I have played in the Springs, but somebody from up there could tell you the same thing. But I always make sure I have a, a big glass of like seven up, something that could be discerned of what it is if I'm there. Uh, like, where's Connie, you know? Uh, your brother-in-law. It's up there, they're trying to encourage me. You need to go start playing in, in Pueblo because I can play. I grew up playing. And they said, you can go and play and beat a lot of people. Well, I don't want to beat people. It's <laughs> not my goal. But if by playing decently, I can talk to them about Jesus and make friends, sure, I get it. But this is the type of thing that we need to understand here. There's a difference between hypocrisy and perception of hypocrisy. What Peter was doing here he was literally playing the hypocrite. Hypocrite in Greek is wearing a mask. And for those of you who know who Hippocrates is, it's basically wearing a mask as an actor would. So in essence, he was not being who he really was. He was playing a role because he felt he needed to whenever the Jewish leadership was coming to town. And when you're playing a role just to try to appease men, guess what? other people are going to follow you. And it's dangerous, I understand, because I'm very, very careful. I won't take a, I won't be, I try not to be near any alcohol, especially if there's family or friends that are around it, because I don't want somebody to see from an angle that, oh, I saw your pastor and there's a beer in front of him. Well, there wasn't a beer in front of me, it was in front of that guy, but you were standing over there, you saw me, and you missed my seven up with the lemon hanging out the side, Right? have to understand that leadership, when we don't act properly, others will follow. That even Barnabas was doing this, the son of encouragement, was following Peter's lead that, hey, when the Jewish leadership is around, we are family, right? But whenever they showed up, another brick in the wall, right? So here we have them. And because of this, verse 14, Paul says he saw they weren't straightforward, about the truth of the gospel. And once again, here is the whole issue for Paul. It's about the truth of the gospel. So publicly tells him, hey, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? In other words, we know that when they're not around, you're going to the pork barbecues, Peter. You are having the bacon. And 
bacon is good, right? But when the Jews come to town, all of a sudden, Peter's back to following the dietary laws of the Jews, trying to, quote unquote, be righteous because of what he's doing. And Paul continues on, we were Jews by nature. Those of us who were born and raised in this, we're not the sinners like the Gentiles, but we know that even we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law. And this, beloved, was, you know, this is Luther's crux. Right? It's not the works of the law that makes us just in God's eyes. Justified, to be declared as righteous. You've heard the play on the word, maybe, and it's a good one, even though it's kind of corny. Justified, just as if I had never sinned. That's what being justified is. It's being declared righteous even though you're not or you weren't. But by faith in Christ, we can be. Do you remember all the way back to the Garden of Eden that this whole concept of being justified is central to human existence? That when Adam and Eve broke the one commandment and God calls them out on it, what's Adam's response? The woman that you gave me. No, no, my fault. God, you gave me the, this woman. But when he brings it to the woman, what does she say? The serpent deceived me and I ate. I'm busted. I can't, you know, my, bus, my man threw me under the bus already. <laughs> though there were no buses. Threw me under the rhino, whatever. <laughs> this concept is so central to human existence that we desire to be justified, to be declared righteous. But guess what? You know what, this law, that law that we're dealing with now, that the, the Ten Commandments and all that God gave them, you know what it makes us all? Unjustified. It reveals the fact that we can't be just on our own, that we can't be righteous. Do you remember when God was dealing with Job? He said this to him in Job chapter 40, verse 8. Would you, this is God speaking, would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Job was an amazing man, but in the midst of his bitterness, he lost sight of the fact that it was the grace of God that had gotten him to where he was at. And so God had to call him out on it. You're, you're going to basically try to condemn me so that you can be justified? See, Paul understood from his own life and throughout human history, no flesh can be justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. You've heard the Latin terms probably sola fide, sola gratia. That's what Martin Luther was talking about. Solely by faith in Jesus Christ can anybody be justified. Can we be declared righteous? And that even of itself, according to Ephesians 2, 9, is not a work. It's a gift from God. So by faith in Christ and Christ alone, can we be justified because Scripture, and God has made it very clear through his scripture, by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. I had uh, a person that I work with in the ministry up out of the Springs, uh, somebody, one of the staff members texted me a couple weeks ago and asked me, so why did God give us the law if we wouldn't be able to keep it then? Honest question, right? This is somebody who's serving in full-time ministry. <laughs> And, and it was like, this kind of sounds strange, but he gave us the law to show that we couldn't keep it. And it's our tutor, according to the book of Galatians, we'll see that later, that what? It leads us to the fact that we need a savior because we can't keep it. And from the beginning, Adam and Eve had how many laws? One. Could they keep the one? No. God gives the 10. Moses breaks all 10, throws them down, right? You know, can we, no, we can't. We cannot. So by the works of the law or keeping of the law, no flesh will be justified. Now, I want to make it very clear because sometimes it's real easy to jump to the conclusion, well, the law is bad then. Oh, gosh, no. The law is great. The law is great when we see it and use it the way that God designed it for. It brings us to the fact that we need a Savior. But so often it's used to bring us into the bondage of men and men who don't have our best interests at heart. Verse 17, 
But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? We've been seeing this all through Paul's writings, and you're going to see it all the way through. He loves to ask the rhetorical question. He's asking a question that is obviously is no, but he wants to make it emphatic here. Certainly not. Christ is not the minister of sin because those who have Christ dwelling within them sin. He's not the minister of sin. And this is one of those things that for many of us, it's so hard to grapple. But remind, a reminder, and maybe you're sick of hearing this, but this, this, this is not the real world, beloved. This is the temporary the spiritual realm is the real world because it is what is eternal. And so God has given us temporary shells and, 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 and it's not saying that this is imaginary, but this is a temporary and we see Jesus throughout all of his teachings and when we went through the gospel of John, Jesus focuses on the eternal. Man has a hard time getting out of the temporary. And so what we're seeing here very clearly from Paul is once again that this justification that can come only by faith in Christ yields a dual nature for us, if you will, right now. But who we really are is not the tent. How many of us have gone to funerals where they've had an open casket and seen the remaining body of somebody that we look at and say, that's not them. Looks kind of like them. And regardless of how good of a beautician there is at the mortuary, they can never make that person look exactly like we remember them. Why? Because the real person's not there. How many people that we have as friends, sometimes you tell them, you're just not yourself today. Does that mean they don't look the same? No, they look the same, but you can tell by their emotions, how they're feeling, how they're acting, how they're talking. They're not themselves. Well, that's because who they really are isn't the shell. And so there's nothing that we can do in these shells that's going to earn our salvation. It comes down to faith in Christ. And is Christ a minister of sin because we continue to sin? No. However, he says here, those things which I destroyed, if I rebuild those things again, if I rebuild, he's saying the law, if I'm rebuilding rules and regulations that supposedly if I follow them and I obey them, now I get to go to heaven? That's what he's saying. If I do that, then guess what? I make myself a transgressor. Because I couldn't keep God's law, why would I think I could keep mine? If we understand that there's an almighty God who has the power to save or to send between eternity and hell, and we can't keep his law? Do we think we're actually going to be able to keep our own? What are we going to do to ourselves if we mess up our law? Ow. Right? What are we going to do? He says that I would be a transgressor. And remember, sinner, sin, we do it. It happens because of our nature. Transgression, we think about it. We actually make a conscious, volitional choice to be disobedient to God's word, transgressor. He's saying that's who we are if we do do that. Because in verse 19, through the law, I died to the law to live to God. And this is one of those ones that until you're actually in faith and even when you're in faith, this can kind of make your head spin. That the law, through the law, I, Chaz, State your name, died to the law to live to God. And that's what the beauty of baptism is and the picture that it paints. Is that when you come to faith in Christ, you're saying, I died on the cross with Jesus. I went into the grave with Jesus. I come out of the water. I resurrected with Jesus. And now I live to God. Now, You are this new creature, you're this new being, but are you like 100% new in the sense of you don't remember what you did the day before, the hour before? No. Once again, the beauty of the temporal versus the eternal. Temporally, you're still pretty much the same, but eternally, you're alive where you were never alive before. And it wasn't that you were mostly dead. (laughs) My Princess Bride fans. 100% completely dead before born again in Christ. And that's why there's this newness and why now you can live to God. But 
Now you've got this battle between the flesh, which is temporal, and the spirit, which is eternal. What's the saying? Which, which, dog, which dog wins the fight? Parts of it? Which what? It's the one that you, yeah, it's the one that you feed. And so we have the temporal and we have the spiritual. Which one are we feeding more? That's the one that wins the fight. That's why the reading of God's word on our own and the things of the Lord be encouraged by those that teach God's word that you like to listen to or you like to read or the music that uplifts your soul and your spirit or simply going out someplace and looking at God's creation is so important, beloved, to get us in tune with the God that loves us. I've heard people say often that Pueblo is ugly. Yeah, people say it. And I get it. And when they hear that you're from San Diego and they say, they compare, I said, you know what, I don't compare them because they're apples and oranges. And this past week, I just needed to get away for a while and saying to my wife, maybe we could drive up to Pikes Peak down in that area or something. She goes, why don't we just go to the reservoir? And it's like, duh, we live right here and we've been there before and we drove there. And there was this spot that I found and I thought to myself, this is amazing took a picture, posted on Facebook, and I'm not a big poster, but I've been since my brother passed just to kind of stay connected to the bigger family in that. But these are the things that help us to realize that through the law, I died to the law, now I live to God. And I live knowing I'm gonna live for eternity. Not based upon how good I'm doing in my walk with the Lord at this moment, but because of the faith that I have in Christ to take care of me wherever I am at. So how do we live and love God now? Began with faith, always continues with faith. Isaiah 29, 13, read this. Therefore the Lord said, inasmuch as the people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men, therefore behold, I will be again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. So he's talking about, I'm going to send my son. Because right now, the people fear me, and you can incorporate this right into that Jewish concept, that they, he's saying that they love him because people are commanding them to love him. And if you're loving someone because you've been commanded to love, are you really loving yeah, all the wives in the house are going, no, no, it's not love. And he's saying, and he's letting us know that, hey, it's got to be based upon this relationship out of a heart that loves. And yes, it's a responsive love. One that says, like Paul in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. And if you leave it at the end of that, guess what? That can be a very depressing thought. However, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Bad news, sin. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. So I will align myself in faith to Christ and I will die on the cross with him. But man, did I have to suffer anything that he suffered for it? No. And most of the things I suffer, I've brought upon myself, but I align myself with him. And by aligning myself with his death, I also know now that I live because he's living in me. Wow. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Beloved, on a day like today, I love how our Bible studies on our Sunday mornings always fall on a day when they align with what's going on in the world because on a Father's Day like today, God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the Father in heaven that loves so much, that will give himself so that we can have faith in his son. See, it says there for me, when Paul says that for me, but when you read that, do you realize when you're reading that that's for you? Insert your name? 
that God loved me and gave himself for me? I don't know about you, but I know me better than anybody outside of God. I wouldn't die for me if I was God. I ain't worthy of it. Especially the death that he took and how he took it. And I'd have to say, I love all of you here and I know some of you a whole lot better than others, but I'm not sure if I'd die for any of you. And that's why I'm not God and amen, yeah. And that's why you're not God because I'm not really sure if you would die for me either, right? But God loves me, gave himself for me. Therefore, verse 21, and this is where I close, I do not set aside the grace of God. Beloved, that's a choice that each and every one of us has to make 24-7, 365. Do we walk in the grace of God or do we set it aside and say, "Ah, I'm going to do things my way. I would rather do things that way. Or do I actually choose to walk in the grace, in the Irene? (laughs) Somebody reminded me last week, I had put a slide up there, it said grace and Irene, and nobody said anything. I thought for sure you would giggle or say, why does it say grace and Irene? Because remember when Paul says grace and peace at the beginning of his letter. Well, Irene is our Englishized version of the Greek word Irene that we get peace from. So it's grace and Irene. And I love that picture that I put up there of those two young girls that walk arm in arm all the time. For me, it's one of the greatest depictions of what it is to be a Christian, is to walk arm in arm with one another and to understand that God is walking with us and the grace and the Irene. And therefore, that's why we are exhorted to not set aside the grace of God and to let this little light of mine may only seem like a funky little 4th of July sparkler, but I tell you, in the darkest of nights, you know what that 4th of July sparkler does? Shine so bright. Shine so bright. So be encouraged this week, beloved, to not set aside the grace of God because if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Jesus never had to go to the cross if we could be good enough to go to heaven. If anybody could have been good enough to go to heaven, Jesus didn't need to go to the cross. And you know why Jesus went to the cross? (laughs) Because not a single human being ever was or was ever going to or is ever going to be sinless and only he could be the one to satisfy what God designed for payment for sin nothing can replace Christ's offering nothing at the cross nothing at the grave nothing can replace that but the enemy of our soul will use means to try to get us to replace it. And that, beloved, is a false gospel. For only by faith in Christ and Christ alone can anyone be saved. And Father, we're thankful this morning for the truth that you give us, that you love us so, and that only by faith in you can anybody be saved. We want to thank you this morning for saving our souls. And we want to thank you for in that spot right now to where we haven't yielded and we don't have that life-giving faith that we'd simply come to you in the quietness of our hearts and make our peace with you. There's no magic words. There's no magic formula. It's simply us coming in truth and honesty of admission where we are and how badly we need you and simply saying that we've come to that point in our life to where we acknowledge this and that we believe that you, Jesus, are the only Son of God, that you, before the foundations of the world, in harmony with the Father and the Spirit, agreed that this would be the way that salvation would be brought for us, that you would be willing to go to that cross on our behalf, be willing to take the sins of the world upon yourself, past, present, and future so that we could experience the love of the Father. And Lord, here we are this afternoon just so thankful for all that you're doing.